Well, good afternoon. My name is Matt Terry, and I'm very happy to welcome you all to November's Research Forum in Wilson Library. We're going to just wait a, about another minute to get started, um, just because uh, we often find that people wander in a minute or two late. And then I'll introduce today's speakers, and I'll talk a little bit about the structure of what we're going to be doing for the next hour, and um, then we'll, we'll listen and uh, learn a lot about our collections. We'll just be a second. All right, I think we've given everybody a good amount of time to arrive today. Um, again, welcome to the Wilson Library Research Forum. My name is Matt Turry and I have the pleasure of speaking today with Hooper Schultz and with Sarah Farkas. The sort of organization of this one hour session is fairly simple. Um, Hooper will speak first for about 20 minutes and then Sarah will talk for another 20 minutes and that'll leave the remainder of the time for um, conversation and questions. There are several ways that you can ask questions. Um, we do have chat and you can type them in there and I will read them out loud. Or if you'd like to raise your hand and ask a question directly, um, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Um, this will be the last research forum for a little bit of a while. Um, November closes out this sequence and then we'll rejoin in the spring starting um, the second Wednesday. Yeah, I think that's correct. The second Wednesday in February. Um, and we're working on the current slate that will be talking to us then, so we, we don't have particular names and topics to share with you yet. So um, just by way of a very brief introduction, and they'll do a much fuller introduction, I'm sure, um, our first speaker today will be Hooper Schultz. Um, Hooper is in the history department here as a doctoral student, and his presentation today, um, at least... <laughs> is um, Other Voices, Other Souths, Gay Liberation in College Towns and on University Campuses. Um, that might not quite be it. There's always a bit of a lag between what I'm reading and what happens when people do their conversation. Still that. Ah, perfect. <laughs> and then Sarah Farkas of the Art History Department will be talking to us today about women's consumption, the portraits and possessions of Anne of Cleves and Sybil of Cleves. And I think one of the things that we often try to do when we have these research forums is because so many of the fellows topics play well together, we do try to structure them in a way that um, allows for maybe a conversation across presentations and across research. That's not always the case. And it's a really nice reminder of both the depth and the breadth of the holdings here in Wilson Library and the various meanings and deep research that they can support. Um, so without any further ado, Hooper. Please take it away. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. My name is Hooper Schultz, um, and I am going to present today on my research from the Wilson Library and the University Archives. So thank you for being here. Um, I do have some thank yous in order first, especially to Matt, um, who guided me to some collections I probably wouldn't have otherwise looked at at the University Archives, um, and to Nadia for organizing this as well as to all of the rest of the archivists and library staff and graduate student workers and undergraduate workers who um, make the complicated reality of running the university archives seem so smooth to us historians. So thank you. Um, I've been lucky to spend so much time in the last year at Wilson Library, especially Southern Historical Collections in the University Archives, and they're proving really foundational um, to my dissertation research, which is on gay liberation student activism in the South. And I'm going to share my screen now. 
Okay. Can everyone see that? Great. Um, so this pre-dissertation research has really allowed me to spend a lot of time thinking about UNC's campus history and look closely at administrators archives. It's helped me to focus my dissertation prospectus research on the kinds of activism that student gay liberation activists were doing and locate it contextually within Chapel Hill's political and social climate, um, which I hope to do for each of the four universities I use as case studies for this dissertation. Um, while my dissertation will devote equal time to exploring the context of all four sites, which are the University of Texas at Austin, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the University of Georgia in Athens, and Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, this presentation is going to focus on UNC and the story of the Carolina Gay Association as interpreted through their archives here in the university archives. So gay liberation movement activism in the 1970s and early 80s has generally been presented by historians as emanating from major metropoles of the North, New York, Chicago, um, and San Francisco, and arriving to the American South late, if at all. Uh, however, with the founding of the Gay Liberation Front, uh, a Gay Liberation Front cell in Austin, Texas in 1970, student activists across the South made use of institutional resources to create long lasting and organizations. The universities I research all share commonalities as large public liberal arts universities in Southern states and gay liberationists activism on at all four institutions fomented successful legal actions with local and national significance. Public universities in the United States functioned as a space where students from all over their states who shared some geographic sensibilities and cultural similarities, met other like-minded young people in a place that was likely more diverse than their hometown. The highly concentrated, or the higher concentrations of young adults devoted to expanding their horizons, furthering social justice and exploring their world and themselves set the stage for gay liberation in these places. While the organizations at each school, the Gay Liberation Front or GLF at the University of Texas, the Carolina Gay Association, Association, which called itself the CGA at UNC, the Committee on Gay Education at UGA, and the Gay Alliance of Students at VCU made decisive impacts. Each had their own origins, stated goals, and local activist context. In Austin and Chapel Hill, activists worked to influence town board members passing non-discrimination protections. Meanwhile, in both Richmond and Athens, student groups filed lawsuits against their universities paving the way for federal courts to guarantee their rights to association and recognition as gay student organizations by those respective university administrations. UNC Chapel Hill's case actually represents an outlier. It is the only one of the four universities whose gay lib group did not sue the university for recognition. It was granted that recognition outright. So the Carolina Gay Association was a group of primarily white male gay graduate students with some undergraduates who began meeting as the Gay Awareness Rap Group. It was one of many such consciousness raising groups popularized by the women's movement during this time. Originally, this quote unquote rap group was a group organized by UNC's Human Sexuality Information Counseling Services or HISICS, which was part of UNC's broader student counseling center. Eventually the rap group, so-called because attendees would rap or speak about their personal experiences in a stream of consciousness style, moved to the Lutheran Student Center off campus and it began accepting non-students. In the middle of the summer of 1974, the Gay Awareness Rap Group applied for official university recognition as the Carolina Gay Association. Perhaps surprisingly, that first application for official recognition was, was recognized by Dean of Student Affairs, Donald Bolton on Friday, September the 6th, 1974. Comparatively, the GLF at UT had applied for recognition in 1970, the Committee on Gay Education at UGA in November 1971, and the Gay Alliance of Students at VCU applied after the Carolina Gay Association in October of 1974. Word spread relatively quickly that a gay group had received recognition by the university and was organized on campus. Newspapers across the state ran stories about the new group of quote unquote homosexuals organizing on campus. 
Keep in mind that these gay lib groups were popping up throughout the country and several, including those started by activists at the University of Georgia and the University of Texas, were already engaged in high profile lawsuits against their universities in 1974. So this was already a conversation being had outside of the university. Individuals from across the state of North Carolina wrote in to complain about the CGA. Additionally, some within university leadership, especially those in fundraising and development, responded negatively with internal letters to both President William Friday and Dean of Students Donald Bolton concerning the university's recognition of the Carolina Gay Association. Both administrators saved these letters and their detailed responses. So here's, um, as you can see on the screen, here's one of those letters from Clarence Whitefield, who was the UNC Director of Alumni Affairs. I um, mean, quote, in my book, it's bad enough if homosexuals simply have an organization, but that's their privilege and I don't question it. Yet I do strongly differ with those who felt the university should extend its official sanction to such a group. Bolton did not alert student members to this barrage according to activist memory, but various responses in his papers at the university archives show his calm and measured responses. Quote, I believe in the right and freedom of this group and any other group to organize in our society and to stand for those things in which they believe, end quote. Bolton wrote back to one concerned donor, quote, I do not ask that they agree with me, only that they have the responsibility to state their beliefs openly and respect the rights of others. And Bolton's words use this same individual rights rhetoric um, that was sweeping the country at the time and we see over and over again in the civil rights movement and the women's movement. Um, and you can see that he's paying attention to the way that these gay liberation groups are thinking about these rights. Um, in addition to these statements of support, by 1976, Bolton would respond to criticisms by sending along the Fourth Circuit court case that showed the students at Virginia Commonwealth University winning recognition of their gay student organization, as well as the ruling in Gay Students Organization of the University of New Hampshire versus Thomas Bonner. Um, that was also in district court. Dean Bolton's relative commitment to the freedom of students to speak and associate had a great impact on the Carolina Gay Association, one of the few gay liberation student groups across the country to not experience considerable legal and bureaucratic resistance to its founding by its home university. The absence of direct hostility from the university administration itself allowed the Carolina Gay Association's founding cohort to move their sites to other activism and organizing, including a non-discrimination ordinance in the town of Chapel Hill, connecting with other gay activists and young people across the state, and organizing the first of what would become the annual Southeastern Gay Conferences. This is not to say that the CGA did not face resistance at UNC. Within a week of its founding, the student body president of UNC told the Daily Tar Heel, the student newspaper, that he would seek to remove funding from the CGA because they planned to anonymize their membership roles. From 1975 to at least 1979, the campus governing council at UNC, of UNC student senators introduced legislation seeking to deny the Carolina Gay Association funding, often packaged along with bills seeking to deny funding to the Black Student Movement and the Association of Women Students. In the fall of 1975, Carolina Gay Association activists, led by Tom Carr, proposed amendments to the Town of Chapel Hill's non-discrimination ordinance that would include, quote, sexual or affectational preference, end quote, to the list of protected classes in public employment. Although the revised personnel ordinance with the addition concerning affectional preference and marital status passed unanimously and with little fanfare, this was a historic moment. In North Carolina, which was already well known on the national scene for longtime Senator Jesse Helms's outspoken views on homosexuality, queer students had affected the passage of a non-discrimination ordinance protecting themselves. They had successfully, and with almost no resistance, added new language to the town code that asserted their rights as queer people to workplace equality. By contrast, New York City, which was widely recognized as an epicenter of the gay liberation movement, would not establish similar protections for another 11 years. While the Chapel Hill students focused and successful local activism was surprising, it was not unique. Across the South, college students led organizing networks based out of universities were reshaping national conversations on the rights of queer Americans. Their bold activism was sometimes intentionally visible and at other times quieter. It took place on campus and off. 
It was more pragmatic and flexible than better studied forms of gay liberation, which scholars have assumed represented a sharp break from the, the respectability politics of the 1960s homophile movement. Another major organizing feat by the CGA, which reflects the wide variety of cultural and political tactics they were engaged with in the mid 1970s, is the founding of the Southeastern Gay Conferences. The conferences were organized on UNC's campus for the spring of 1976, less than two years after the CGA had been founded. CGA activists obtained permission to hold the weekend's events in the Student Union's Grand Ballroom and had more than 20 conference sessions organized around topics such as lesbian feminism, kink, coming out to parents, passing non-discrimination ordinances in your hometown, and race and class problems in the gay community. The first conference was organized in the day, was advertised, excuse me, in the Daily Tar Heel, local and regional gay newspapers such as the Front Page in Raleigh and the Atlanta Bard, and was spread by flyers and word of mouth throughout the region in gay bars. Attendees came from as far as Memphis and Tallahassee. More than 200 people attended the first conference in April of 1976. Um, this was a pretty impressive number considering that same-sex sex acts were considered a felony in the state at the time, and intending such a gathering was a rather explicit admittance of one's sexuality. These conferences continued annually into the 1990s, moving from location to location across the South. So two of the themes that I'm working through as I continue to write this dissertation prospectus um, revolve around connectivity and space and how those two factors are influencing gay liberation in a distinctly Southern context. So when I'm thinking about connectivity, some questions that I'm still mulling over, are how did gay liberation activists at UNC and in other universities across the South and country maintain communication? How do national and local gay media outlets connect with student activists? And how did individuals hear about the conferences? Um, another piece of this puzzle for me is about the university administration and the physical space of UNC um, and how that's influencing gay liberation activism. So Dean Bolton's support undoubtedly shaped the Carolina Gay Association's early actions and priorities. But I'm wondering how this compares and contrasts with the other universities. Um, how did the physical space of campus, UNC's kind of um, connection with Chapel Hill and how there's not really a distinct on-campus, off-campus, uh, demarcation sometimes and its proximity to Durham, uh, how all of those things influence gay liberation activism at UNC. And I'm thinking through this all, I think those questions are really connected about connectivity and the administration and physical space shaping gay liberation. Um, student activists were absolutely, you know, using university materials, phone lines, mimeograph machines, printing services, and mailboxes to spread gay liberation ethos and produce print materials. Um, so I'm going to end it there. I really welcome any thoughts or questions anyone has. Um, and thank you again for being here. Thank you, Hooper. Um, so we're going to go on to our next presentation, and then we'll 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 address the questions just so we make sure we get the sort of set pieces. Um, done. Um, one thing I did neglect in my sort of haste to get to Hooper's conversation was that Hooper was a recipient of a Southern Studies Fellowship here at Wilson Library um, that supports pre-dissertation work. Um, it's basically a feasibility study. Does this, does the body of records here um, do what you, you really need and hope for it to do? Um, and also, I didn't mention that Sarah was the, um, the recipient of the Haynes Graduate Fellowship. I, I neglect that. So Sarah, um, on to you and then for questions. You're you're very garbled, Sarah. Is that true for other people too? Yes. Still remains very um, choppy, I guess. Yes.
Hmm. Nadia, do you have any suggestions? I I, I don't. Um, unless maybe Sarah, you want to um, hop off and restart your computer really quick and come back in. In, in the meanwhile, there are a few questions we can um, address to Hooper. So um, just looking quickly, um, Joanne Johnson writes, um, I know you don't have time to discuss them today, but what are the three other universities you are using in your comparisons? And then as a, as, as a, as a related question, um, Professor Ferris is asking, how did you choose the four universities? Um, and will you use the UNC collection of beat materials? <laughs> uh, these are great questions, yes. So Joanne, um, the other universities that I'm looking at are the University of Texas at, in Austin, um, which had a gay liberation front cell that was founded in 1970. Um, then the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia, um, and their Committee on Gay Education was another early gay liberation organization in the South. Uh, and then finally, it's Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia, and they had the Gay Alliance of Students, um, which is kind of developing concurrently with UNC's Carolina Gay Association, um, but winds up going into a lawsuit because the university declines to recognize the student organization. Um, and this kind of goes into Bill's question um, about how I chose the four universities. And so really my research began at UNC um, with this pre-dissertation um, research and fellowship. And I began to see these other universities popping up, um, both in the records of the Carolina Gay Association, the student activists talking about these other gay student groups, as well as the university administration who are sharing these court cases, these lawsuits with one another. Um, and I was actually able this summer to go to Austin and do some research there. And there's a kind of parallel thing going on where the Dean of Students at the University of Georgia has sent, mim sent mimeographed copies of the lawsuit to both the Dean of Students at UT Austin and the Dean of Students at UNC. Um, so they're all in conversation, which was really fascinating. Um, Hooper, we have another question, but it, it is also interesting. You see that same sort of pattern of behavior um, amongst university administrators about lawsuits um, for integration of African-Americans into, um, into um, these majority white institutions. Um, it looks like, um, Marcy Ferris, uh, Professor Ferris is asking, what kind of pushback do you see Dean Bolton receiving from UNC administration? Yeah, that's a really interesting uh, part of this, Marcy, that uh, President William Friday is really hands off with this. He, he refers the letters that he receives concerning um, the Carolina Gay Association and negative reactions from different stakeholders. He refers those letters to Dean Bolton, who then handles them. So it really, Dean Bolton was kind of given measure to support the CGA in this hands-off way. Um, and he just, he really responds by, by pointing to the different court cases that are unfolding and um, the students' First Amendment rights. So I wouldn't say that there was necessarily a lot of pushback from the administration. There are letters that Bolton has received from folks like the director of uh, alumni affairs at UNC, who obviously was concerned about his fundraising capabilities if this organization was on campus. We, um, we do have another question. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is when you were showing the, the um, when you were showing the letter, so that was from Lindsay, Lindsay Warren, the, um, the congressman? So the, the letter is on letterhead from two directors of the alumni association i believe um the letter is from clarence whitefield oh okay yes um one of our colleagues tim hodgden here is is he writes i'm a historian of white radical feminism working here at the library do you have a sense of how the unc association might have been using radical feminist kate millett's concept of sexual politics i saw this question and tim this is a great question and i've written it down um, I don't know that I really have a great answer for this right now, but it's something that I need to consider.
other questions while we wait for Sarah's reboot? I have a question. Yes, please. Um, thanks so much, Hooper. Uh, that was really interesting to hear about, especially since it's so close to home at UNC. Um, I'm curious if you have thoughts or, you know, if this is already a part of the literature and you're drawing from this on why um, college campuses were so influential in this moment in terms of research, especially relative to like national research you used the example in New York. Um, why, why do you think specifically in the context of gay, gay liberation, our college is so influential? Yeah, uh, this is, I think, really gonna, gonna wind up being one of the central questions of my dissertation. Um, my hunch here and, and what I'm still kind of working through and chewing on as I get to all these different archives and continue doing oral history interviews is that there's this like, this imagined, right? Or, and sometimes real, um, kind of liberal environs around a college, like a college town, the imaginary of the college town. And so many, I, I'm also an oral historian. So many of the gay liberation activists that I've interviewed for this project talk about even before they came to UNC, imagining um, what it would be like to be in Chapel Hill. Um, and Austin, Texas, you, I I've, have some oral histories where folks are kind of describing that same thing there. So I think, that's one part of it. Um, I think another part of it is that the actual like state supported infrastructure of the university becomes integral to activist movements. So using those phone lines for free long distance calling, the ability to rent these large spaces for cheaply or for nothing as a student group. So the ability to use the Frank Porter Graham student union is like a huge boon for an organization such as this, right? Um, and also that that key point about young people, like these young students who, some of whom are on grants to be here, coming to a college campus and kind of experiencing this like tumult and this melding. And I think that we can point to like a longer activist history on college campuses. I mean, UNC has the speaker ban um, and the activism around that in 1968, and this is six years later. So I think there's also, um, some of the activists who were here for the founding of the CGA in 1974 are graduate students, and they actually were around in 1968, right? So these are actually not these like disparate, completely disjunct activist movements, but there's this longer tradition of student activism on Southern college campuses that they're participating in. Looks like um, Sarah is almost ready. I just, there is one more question that it might be nice to, to get in before we transition out. Um, Joanne Johnson is asking a, another follow-up and um, she was asking, well, she was really asking about oral histories, the original graduate student cohort in 74 and, um, uh, and oral histories and other, um, I guess, personal manuscript materials that might help sort of enlarge your discussion. Yeah, um, I am a, Southern Oral History Program field scholar. Um, I've been really lucky to be able to do that work here at UNC. And I have been making oral histories with activists from the Carolina Gay Association since I began my master's research back in 2017. Wow. Um, so I've made now, let's see, more than 20 oral histories with student activists that were involved in gay liberation, most of them at UNC a couple at UT Austin. Um, and I hope to continue doing that. I'm currently trying to find more folks from UT Austin. And I have a couple folks from UNC that I'd still like to get to. Um, but that is definitely a central part of this project, right? It's I'm, I'm pretty fortunate that so many of those folks are still around. Um, well, thank you. And um, in, in at the end, we may have time for more questions. Um, Sarah, did you want to go ahead and see if your microphone is working better now? Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. Hopefully this will this will hold. I'm going to keep my camera off in case there's a um, it's a connection issue. Um, try not to. Okay. Overload the poor Wi-Fi. <laughs> oh. 
And are you able to see the PowerPoint set up? All right, well, fingers crossed that everything holds. <laughs> All right, so uh, like Cooper, I just wanted to quickly uh, thank everyone at the Wilson for their time. Um, frankly, not just this summer, but since 2020, you know, there was an event that happened um, in uh, the summer of 2020. So I was originally supposed to work on my fellowship uh, that summer, but uh, had to delay for uh, for obvious safety reasons and was so glad to be able to finally get in there um, and finish up this past uh, summer. So thank you to uh, Matt for being in contact that whole time, uh, everyone in the Wilson over the summer helping me gather materials. I also wanted to thank uh, Taylor. I don't think she's on this today, but she was also incredibly helpful with all of the scheduling. So it was a really great experience. And um, maybe also just uh, throw in a plug here for the value of physical collections. I think as someone who works on um, stuff that's uh, that's it's quite old, um, I work on 16th century materials that uh, for me, it's um, really about being able to be with the physical objects as much as it is to be able to see the content. And I know we live in a time of you know increasing digitization of things, which is great for access, but uh, I think, uh, we don't want to lose the value of being able to uh, physically interact with some of these objects. And hopefully I can make a little bit of a case for that as I discuss what I looked at over the summer. So without further ado, um, before I dive into those materials, I was going to give just a brief overview of what my dissertation is hopefully going to be about. I actually just presented my prospectus uh, last June, so right at the beginning stages of working on this project, um, which is tentatively titled Women's Consumption, the Portraits and Possessions of Anne of Cleves and Sybil of Cleves. And it's going to center around these two women, uh, Anne, whom you see here on the right, and her sister, Sybil. Many of you may already be familiar with Anne somewhat, especially if you're avid consumers of uh, historical television dramas, or maybe you enjoy the musical Six that's uh, on Broadway right now. She was the fourth wife of Henry VIII of England. They were married in early 1540, um, and they were only married for about six months before um, Henry had the marriage annulled. Um, you know, famously, it said that he claimed that her... Um, her likeness did not live up to the visage that you see here in this portrait. She was not uh, beautiful in person. Um, and of Henry's six, uh, six wives, all of whom are um, quite infamous, she's maybe one of the ones that had the better outcome because she enjoyed a hefty uh, divorce settlement uh, after their marriage was annulled. And she actually became one of the wealthiest women in England um, where she lived for another 17 years. And what interests me about her as a case study is there's really been um, very little to no work done Done on what she is doing for those 17 years um, when she's no longer Queen of England. Uh, her sister Sybil, whom you see on the left, is much less well known outside of German speaking countries. Um, but as my dissertation is going to argue, she is among one of the most influential female figures of the Protestant Reformation, Reformation in the mid 16th century. She was married to John Frederick, the Elector of Saxony, and the pair of them were great friends with Martin Luther and his wife, and um, quite hardline reformers involved in the, uh, the Reformation of Germany or what would become Germany, I should say. So despite the fact that they spend much of their adult lives in separate countries, Anne and Sybil actually have quite a lot in common. So they make, of course, marriages to very powerful men. They had access to an incredible amount of wealth and they're living through the early periods of reformation in both England and Germany. And those reformations go somewhat differently, which makes them an interesting uh, comparison. But as an art historian, what makes them particularly interesting to me is that both of them left behind just an enormous corpus of portraiture. So I'm going to show you just a few examples, just a few examples here. Um, you can see these are portraits of Sybil that were done by Lucas Craddock the Elder at his workshop um, during the uh, last 20 years or so of her life. This is just quite a sample of the um, images with uh, her face on them that were produced in her lifetime. And then similarly, Anne had quite a few um, portraits and miniatures done of her during her lifetime and um, just shortly thereafter. But what makes them, I think, doubly interesting is in addition to these portraits, they left behind just an unusually large record of the stuff, the things that they owned, objects, furniture, jewelry, things like that in inventories, wills, letters, court cases, um, and other kinds of records that are still available in England um, and in Germany today. 
So ultimately, my dissertation is going to treat these two women as case studies for how elite early modern women used objects to establish their identities um, by comparing the way they are presented in their portraits with how they were consuming objects through actions like gift giving, uh, patronage, worship, and different kinds of bequests. Um, which brings me to uh, what I was doing in the Wilson this summer. One of the questions of this dissertation is what made an ideal woman and how do objects um, produce those kinds of definitions, um, both in their physical pre presence and in the way they were represented in portraiture. So thanks to the Haynes Graduate Fellowship, I was able to spend about three months working with documents in the rare book collection, and I was primarily focused on documents related to social conduct and courtly behavior um, in order to help me understand um, Anne, in particular, her portrayal of her portraits and the consumption of goods. Um, since I was really just looking at England uh, documents related to England while I was in the Wilson, um, I was mostly considering Anne. Fortunately, we'll have to make, but fortunately, have to make a trip to Germany to um, get some more information to contextualize Sybil. But um, in relation to Anne, I was looking at objects and texts that can be, you know, broadly sorted into four categories: um, writings that were about the English monarchy and maybe directly referenced, and particularly um, things uh, that were produced about um, the Tudor monarchs in the 16th century. Um, books on female conduct, and I'll get into what that means uh, a little bit later in this presentation. I was also looking at books of images. This included prints that were done by Hans Holbein the Younger, the uh, portraitist that did the portraits of Anne that you see here on the right, and um, also books of emblems um, and their meanings. And then finally, I was also interested in looking at um, 16th century handwritten documents, um, not just uh, printed books, um, but in order to sort of improve my paleographic skills, as I anticipate that I'll be um, getting into the archives in the British Library, the National Archives in England, and we need um, to be a little bit better uh, at deciphering some of those um, archaic scripts. So um, I looked at about a couple dozen sources while I was at the Wilsons. I'm not gonna have time to discuss each and everything that I looked at today, but I wanted to give you a few highlights from each of those four categories. So um, histories of Henry VIII and Anne of Cleves is the first grouping that I'll talk about here. Since I'm at the beginning phase of my doctoral research, one of my goals at the Wilson was to consult a number of these 16th and 17th century histories of the Tudor monarchs, um, particularly looking at Henry VIII, of course, her husband, um, his son, Edward VI, and then his daughter, Queen Mary I, and died um, in the middle of uh, Mary's reign. So those would be the three monarchs that covered her lifetime. And these histories demonstrate uh, really a wide variety of approaches by early modern historians to discussing Anne. So for example, I looked at the Annals of England from 1630, and this really only includes um, just a couple short sentences that acknowledge that they got married and that there was an annulment. Um, she got a little bit of a settlement, although it doesn't go into the details, um, but it doesn't uh, give much um, information about what her later life was like. Um, I found that to be uh, similarly so in the history of the lives of the kings of England that was uh, printed in 1637. Um, also has a very short description of Anne's reign and doesn't talk about her later life. Um, by contrast, however, the ecclesiastical memorials, there's an 1822 reprint of the 17th century original that's held by the Wilson, and this actually discusses uh, her marriage negotiations um, at quite a great length. Um, specifically is talking about that. I hope you can't hear my dog whining next to me. Sorry if that's coming through. <laughs> um, that specifically goes into the um, marriage negotiations and uh, political negotiations between Henry VIII and the Duke of Saxony, who was Sybil's husband. And he was um, quite involved um, in this marriage negotiation because, of course, it was um, a pretext for an alliance between some of the German-speaking lands and, uh, and England. Um, but there was quite a divide over religious concerns because England was not, uh, was not, Luther, was not going Lutheran, so, um, and the Duke of Saxony was. So there's a lot of information about the differences between the religious concerns of these two countries. Um, and of course, it interests me that Sybil's husband is so uh, heavily involved in this negotiation. Um, there are also uh, reprints of some of the letters that go between Henry VIII and um, the Duke of Saxony. So I'm interested in um, digging in. I haven't unfortunately gotten through um, all of them yet, but digging through some of the letters um, that go between them and um, you know, to what extent uh, these women are involved um, in or mentioned in these letters. 
Uh, another uh, aspect of the ecclesiastical memorials that was helpful to me for this dissertation project is um, there are several uh, reproductions of accounts of gift giving at the Tudor court. So, for example, um, there's the disposition of Catherine of Aragon's jewels and clothes after her death. And um, I'm at this early stage of my research, very much interested in finding sort of comparative studies that I can use to contextualize Anne and Sybil. So looking at the ways that other women are um, dispossessing their, um, their objects when they die, how they're giving gifts, how they're um, patronizing partisan things. This is just another example that I can add as a comparison to these two women. Um, and uh, similarly, I found that there were um, additional sort of examples of the political negotiations between the Duke and Henry VIII in the life and reign of King Henry VIII from 1649, which is also held by the Wilson. So it's been interesting to see how these different historians in the mid 17th century are discussing um, this, although it's a very brief marriage, um, the sort of importance of trying to forge the alliance between uh, the German princes and, and Henry. All right, so I'm going to move on to the discussion of sort of these early modern conduct books. So when I say conduct books, I'm talking about a genre of book um, that was popular in the 16th century that sort of laid out the rules for how um, gentlemen and gentlewomen, people of elite status should behave, um, how they should conduct themselves in public, how they should raise their children, how they should um, dress when they go to court, uh, the kinds of sport they should engage in, really sort of these all-encompassing um, lifestyle handbooks for um, for the elite men and women um, in England at the time. And the Wilson fortunately holds actually a couple copies of Richard Braithwaite's The English Gentlewoman and The English Gentleman. Um, and I was particularly drawn to the 1631 copy that they have here. There were some, some nice um, marginal notes that someone has written in some of these, which is again, sort of why it's so great to be able to get uh, hands-on experience with some of these books, because a lot of that can be difficult to read in a, a digital reproduction. They're, they can be quite light and um, difficult to see. So being able to look at them in person is incredibly helpful. I'll confess, I'm still having trouble deciphering some of these marginal notes because of the, um, the handwriting that this person has used, but I'm looking forward to figuring out what was interesting to the reader of this um, this book. And um, the English, Braithwaite's English gentlewoman is um, interesting to me because he talks quite a bit about apparel and how women um, should be dressing themselves. And uh, he talks first, you know, about the necessity of clothing biologically, you know, we need clothing to uh, keep warm and survive. But he also talks about it in a very uh, 16th century context, things that might not be important to us now that were important to them then. So for example, they considered women to be um, colder bodies than men and produced a lot of heat and women did not. So that explains some of the differences between men and women's clothing, according to Braithwaite uh, in this text. So very interesting to see some of the aspects of um, attire that are uh, different culturally for people at the time. Um, of course, he talks about morality, um, as we might expect, and that we have to protect ourselves from shame. So uh, that is the, the purpose of some of the clothes that we wear. Um, and then uh, a surprise for me in um, reading his writing was the, uh, his emphasis on the importance of dress and how it relates to one's um, country of origin and their customs, which is a question that um, I'm still trying to answer about Anne's later life and to what extent she was still perceived of as uh, German and foreign, despite the fact that she actually lives you know, about half of her life um, in England, um, certainly the later part of her life, she is in England, she is participating at court. So I don't know to the extent in real life she was actually presenting as German, but certainly in her portraiture, she's continued to be portrayed in these very German style um, articles of clothing, even though she's been living in England for, you know, almost two decades uh, by the time she dies. So I was interested in seeing Braithwaite's um, sort of emphasis on um, clothing as being representative of one's um, country of origin and identity and the importance of continuing to dress in clothing that represents that part of one's identity.
Um, another surprise for me, and I've got a picture of the um, frontispiece of the title page for the Pleasant Quips for Upstart Newfangled Gentlewoman, which was originally published in 1596. This is the Wilson's copy is a, a 1942 reprint, um, but this was also just uh, quite an enjoyable read for me. It's a late uh, 16th century poem about women's vanity. Um, so it does go into um, some of the things that women wore. So I was interested in it from that perspective, but of course it's quite um, um, it's a bit cutting and um, critical of the way that elite women are dressing. So I'm also interested, given the religious aspect of um, the marriage to Anne, um, the changing religious values in England at the time, um, to what extent uh, clothing and um, objects related to attire are representative of um, maybe uh, modesty um, and things relating to her religion, and to what extent she is um, participating in the, um, the vanity that elite women are being criticized for in poems like this. So uh, another group of things that I looked at, which were a little bit, um, you know, uh, farther afield from my dissertation, but interest me in terms of other projects were um, some books of images from um, 16th century uh, England and Germany. So I'm showing here two woodcuts from Hans Holbein the Younger's Der Totentanz, which is a book of 40 woodcuts that Holbein produced between 1523 and 1525. So this is before he actually came to England um, to work as Henry VIII's portraitist, and he's still in Germany. Um, and they show uh, different uh, people of different um, life positions, different statuses, uh, people who work for the church, uh, uh, elite people, people of lower status, and um, they're uh, sort of a warning that sort of death comes for us all. It's a very happy collection of woodcuts. And um, I've shown here the um, Die Herzogin and der Hutzog, the uh, Duke and the Duchess, um, which would be the social status that um, Sybil and her husband enjoyed. So I was interested in these from a perspective of seeing an example of um, their clothing, but also um, an example of Holbein's early style and how I might be able to compare that to what he's doing in Sybil's portraits. Um, I was also able to look at a choice of emblems and other devices, which is a, a collection of different symbols and devices that um, appear both in portraiture and other um, visual sources in the 16th century. And it's an excellent reference book for what these different kinds of symbols uh, mean. Um, you know, especially the 16th century context, they may have a different meaning than what we might see them as today. Um, and this actually interests me for a project outside of my dissertation. Um, for my master's thesis, I worked on a uh, girdle book from the 1540s that has a lovely um, enamel image of Moses and the brazen serpent on one of its uh, faces that resulted in a conference paper for the 16th Century Society Conference last year. Um, and I'm looking to develop that into a journal article. So this uh, book of emblems has actually been um, excellent for providing some context for um, some of the symbols on that girdle book. So it was another um, wonderful find that's helping me in a different area of my research. And then finally, I was able to get some practice with um, some 16th century documents. So one of the documents I've been working on is this Frank Pledge from the reign of Mary Tudor since the 15, mid 1550s. Um, this doesn't relate to Anne or, or Sybil at all. Um, a Frank Pledge was actually a legal document that bound a group of people to make sure that another person who had been accused of a crime actually makes it to court or else the other group of people gets fined. So I think it's a very uh, wonderful <laughs> bond system that they had developed. Um, but for me, this has been helpful in working on um, actually practicing with real documents um, and transcribing them. And I've been able to um, work on that as I'm getting through a course with the Folger Shakespeare Library on paleography. So um, it's been helpful to have uh, resources like that uh, available to me in person. So just to wrap up here, um, I just want to, of course, once again, thank the Wilson Library um, for allowing me access to the materials in the rare book collection. It's provided me with a lot of contextualizing material for my research, uh, particularly on women's conduct and dress practices, that I'm hoping is going to be a nice foundation for when I'm able to get into the British Library and the National Archives. Um, hopefully this coming summer, um, get a little bit of that paleography practice um, under my belt as well. So I'll be able to dive into those um, inventory records while I'm there. 
Um, I welcome any questions that you all have for me. I'm just going to hedge slightly and say, please go easy on me because my son was born three days after I finished <laughs> in the Wilson Library. Uh, maybe he'll make a camera appearance here at some point if he's not taking a nap, but uh, he only just started sleeping through the night last week. <laughs> so um, hopefully I can, uh, I'll be able to answer uh, your questions with um, some clarity. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so there are two questions in the chat, and um, I'm hoping that you can see them too. I always find seeing helpful. Um, here's one from Tim Hodgden, who's one of our colleagues who's a historian. Um, I'm wondering if John Berger's ingenious, ingenious little book about sexual object, objectification, Ways of Seeing, has helped you frame your project. And just to get them both in for now. Yeah. And then Professor Farris is asking, are there any resources on the designers and fabricators of the clothing and jewelry you discuss? Uh, thank you both for your, um, for your questions. So um, I'm actually not familiar with John Berger's book about sexual objectification. So thank you for that. I'm going to write that down and check that out as I get back into my work here. Um, but I am very much interested in the gendered aspects of the way that. Uh, identity is being created in these portraits and with different kinds of objects. So I think that'll be quite useful to me. Uh, so thank you for that. And then um, designers and fabricators. That's a great question. Actually, one of the um, wonderful things is that um, particularly for jewelry, a lot of the designers um, are actually the artists that are making some of these portraits as well. So Hans Holbein was actually um, quite a well-known designer of um, gold and silver objects. We actually have some of his designs for things like girdle books, as I mentioned, um, was one object that he has, um, he designed for people at the Tudor court. And there are a number of other artists that uh, we know were there and making these objects. There's um, even some records of people ordering jewelry. So we have some letters. There's a couple of letters left of um, Mary Tudor when she was a princess before she was the queen um, ordering some, um, gold jewelry and we have the letters uh, of her ordering those designs so we can see a little bit about the back and forth between uh, the person who was going to buy that object and the person who was designing it and how they were involved in requesting aspects of the design hope that answers your question other questions for sarah or for hooper we have about eight minutes seven minutes It is, it is sort of refreshing. I've often made the argument that it's a good, Wilson Library is a good way to sort of test out archival skills before you sort of start burning serious money and, and flights to various places. I know we've had some people look at the Papayan papers to see that they could read um, sort of 18th and 17th century Spanish colonial writing. So it's, it's nice to hear that we're able to help you out. Um, Professor Ferris has a, another question. Oh, Sarah, how did the collections you use come to UNC? Do you know about the provenance? You know, I'm going to have to go back to my notes to look at some of the specifics. Um, quite a few of the um, sort of fragment documents that I was looking at um, in order to work on those paleographic skills were actually owned by one collector. But off the top of my head, I, I can't remember um, who donated them to the collection. So Hooper, um, Francis Barrett is asking, what was your experience like moving between oral history and physical archives? Oh, this is a question I could go on and on about. Um, I think that one of the really fascinating things about doing oral history is that when you're making an oral history with a narrator, their memory of events is shaped you know, necessarily by all of the experiences they've had between that event and the, the day, the time you're making that oral history with them. <clears throat> so oftentimes there's narr there are narrators that live in Chapel Hill um, who I'm thinking about who also have donated parts of these collections. Um, and the way that they remember certain events are contradicted by the materials that they themselves have donated. Um, and I, I'm always kind of 
I, I like to, I, I, I think that that tension is kind of good in some ways. Um, I like to point it out and kind of sit with it and not necessarily try to be like, this is the truth of, of what's happened. Um, and it, it kind of helps me to put both the, you know, like, uh, let's say like a mainstream newspapers article about something that the gay liberation activists at UNC did to, to also point out the like biases in that um, while also pointing out kind of the inconsistencies in oral history. If that makes sense. I'll read the comment too. It's super interesting, which, which I agree. I think the tension between the two is really an interesting thing to dwell on. Not everybody has that <laughs> sort of. All right. I think we have time for one more question or we can go eat lunch. Well, I'd like to thank you both. I thought this was really fascinating. Um, I was shocked at how many portraits were generated and I wondered about how much time was was used sitting. Um, but, but thank you again. And um, we'll be making more announcements about research forums for the spring and we really hope to see you back then. You all take care. Thank you. Thank both. you, everyone. Thank you. That was um, really, really great. And thank you, Sarah, for sticking with us. Um, I'm glad it worked out. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I don't know why.